Welcome to my talk on collective variables in complex systems, especially in molecular and uh, fluid dynamics. This talk will have uh, two parts. The first will be a simple and short uh, introduction to manifold burning, and especially diffusion maps. If uh, you know about diffusion maps, then feel free to skip the first about 16 and a half uh, minutes of this talk, where we will start uh, the second part on collective variables. As a warm up, let me start with a question to you. Consider this data set of 36 pictures. These are 36 data points in approximately 10,000 dimensions. The pictures have 10,000 pixels. And I would like to ask you to take a moment and uh, think of a very simple one sentence summary of the entire data set. Feel free to stop the video now and think about it. To resolve the issue, my short summary of the entire data set would be that I had it shown from different angles. Now, note that my summary was emphasizing the largest one dimensional variation in this data set, the viewing angle, and I was completely ignoring insignificant variation in lightning change, camera tilt, or maybe change of the mimic. In some sense, this is one very important aspect of learning, machine learning, or manifold learning in this particular case, namely to convert data into useful and efficient knowledge. Now, a machine might have a hard time because with the advancement of technology, uh, we get more and more high dimensional observations uh, with which we run into problems like curse of dimension and approximation, sampling, and uh, that there is not obvious uh, what norm to apply in this high dimensional so-called ambient space as uh, there is no numerical norm equivalence and our choice might matter a lot. What saves us is that this apparent high dimensionality of the data is just an artifact of the choice of our representation of our measurement. And at its heart, the situation is still somehow low dimensional. And this will be our standing assumption here. To be a little bit more precise, the question which we are posing is whether there is a mapping phi which takes our data set D, which is in a high dimensional ambient space X and maps it into a low dimensional space Y such that it keeps all the important information but discards all the irrelevant one. For our example of this faces data set, this mapping would take the 10,000 dimensional data set and map it to something one dimensional which uh, contains the viewing angle of the faces. Now there are lots of approaches to this problem, to this problem of dimension reduction. Probably the simplest one would be clustering. I would like to group uh, close by points together. There are methods, linear methods like principal component analysis, which ask for the best fit linear hyperplane to our point cloud, and nonlinear versions of it, kernel PCA, which uh, acts in an unknown feature space. Uh, and all we know, all we have access to is uh, inner products in this feature space between data points uh, as given by a kernel. And there is, for example, multidimensional scaling, which uh, has access to pairwise distances between data points and tries to find a low dimensional uh, configuration of points which reproduce the distances to a high accuracy. Then again, a different view would be uh, to reduce the dimensionality through random linear projections. Now, all these methods had in common that they were using angles and distances, so somehow global geometric features of the data. However, global distances 
in ambient space might not be a good idea as this left picture, this example shows us. This is a two dimensional strip rolled up in three dimensions, sampled by points. And uh, between these two circles, the ambient space distance would be shown by this dashed line, which is not a good intrinsic distance. The intrinsic distance between these two points along the data would be the, ge uh, the geodesic distance, which is shown here by the solid line. And this is actually we would like to work with. So this gave rise to the method called isomap, which uh, said we want to act locally, but think globally. The idea is that local distances in the ambient space are still good approximation of local intrinsic distances, as long as the manifold has bounded curvature. And from local distances, we can patch together a geodesic by a shortest path problem, as uh, it's shown here in the middle picture. Having this, we can then use methods like multidimensional scaling link to unroll the situation and find the two-dimensional intrinsic geometry of this configuration. So this promoted local methods, and a lot of them arose, uh, but somehow all of them were ignoring some properties of global geometry. Either it was implicitly in there or not discussed at all. And it was a method called diffusion maps, which brought back this global geometric framework again into discussion, to the consideration um, by considering an idea which, is, which was actually out there for a while, but in pure uh, mathematics, if I can put it this way, nobody knew about it. To approach the problem, from a little bit of different angle, let's take an excursion in spectral geometry. The, the main focus here is on the Laplace Beltrami operator on a manifold and its spectrum. And the question is how this spectrum is connected to the intrinsic geometry of the manifold. The idea which we are going to use is uh, very simply put, uh, by this example of a rectangle, a two-dimensional rectangle, on which the Laplacian has two dominant uh, eigenfunctions. One of them is half a cosine x, and one of them is half cosine y. Now the idea is that both these uh, half cosines are one-to-one -one with the x and the y coordinate respectively. So these two coordinates are capable of parametrizing the whole manifold. This is even the case if this manifold is somehow rolled up in a higher dimensional space. This two dimensional, these two parameters, these two coordinates parametrize the manifold still. And now, since uh, the Laplace operator it generates diffusion or heat flow, it is not surprising that uh, the method with which we would like to go back at it um, is going to be a diffusion process on our data points. Assume that we have M data points lying on a manifold in a high dimensional ambient space where the manifold is smooth and it is low dimensional. The points are drawn according to an IID distribution, which we denote by Q, and uh, this assumption is uh, simply by the fact that we would like to give some convergence results later. And assume we have a kernel, uh, which is symmetric and positive, and it's just usually a Gaussian kernel with a bandwidth epsilon. Let us put together a similarity matrix. Uh, which measures similarity of two data points, uh, i and j, by their evaluation of the kernel, put its row sum as a degree matrix. It's a diagonal matrix with these degrees on the diagonal, and use this to normalize the kernel matrix to a stochastic matrix, and 
thus giving us so-called diffusion matrix or the transition matrix of a Markov chain of a diffusion process which is jumping between the data points. Now, using this diffusion matrix, we can define something called the diffusion distance, which uh, uses or defines uh, a weighted L2 norm between rows of the transition matrix. It uses these to define distance between two data points, x1 and xj, and the weight is usually taken to be the inverse degree matrix from before. There is also a so-called diffusion map, which we are going to consider. This uh, looks at right eigenmodes of the diffusion matrix, psi L, with corresponding eigenvalues lambda L, considers these eigenvectors as functions on the data. So the ith entry of this vector is the map of uh, the uh, ith data point by this function. And defines a diffusion map, which is this capital Psi here. And uh, this assigns to any data point x a vector where the coordinates are the corresponding entries in the diffusion matrix eigenvectors scale by the eigenvalues. Now the main, one main achievement by Kaufmann and Lafon who invented this diffusion maps is to connect this diffusion distance to diffusion map, basically saying that the diffusion distance, which is a natural distance on the manifold of data points, is recovered as a Euclidean distance if we embed our data points by the diffusion map into Euclidean space. And this diffusion map might be a high dimensional map if we have many data points. Uh, it turns out that actually we can just as well take most of the situations, just a few of the first diffusion map components, and by this obtain a good approximation of the diffusion map in a very low dimension. So this is the idea which we're going to follow. Let us look at what this diffusion map actually corresponds to. The similarity matrix can be connected to a integral operator with respect to the kernel. However, this integral operator is biased by the distribution of the data points. And this is something we don't have control over, and we would like to get rid of this so-called something bias. The second achievement of Kaufmann Lafon was to get rid of it by a so-called pre-normalization. We take again our degree matrix D and uh, take it to the power of minus alpha, where alpha is some number between zero and one. This is a pre-normalized similarity matrix, which we then normalize such that it is again a stochastic matrix. Doing this, this is what arises. If we take again our two-dimensional strip rolled up in three dimensions example, the difference between the non-normalized alpha equal to zero and the normalized alpha equal to one diffusion map is the following. What you see here at the bottom are diffusion map embeddings of the top data set by the first two diffusion map coordinates, where you see the rectangular structure of the strip is obtained pretty nicely in the alpha equal to one case. So why, why does it work so well? Or what are we approximating actually? For this, we take the diffusion map uh, matrix, P, the alpha normalized one. We subtract the identity and uh, divide by epsilon to get the so-called generator. And uh, it can be shown that this generator pointwise converges to a differential operator, which still depends on the sampling density Q. But if we now take alpha equal to one, as a special case here at the bottom, we see that uh, the limiting operator itself doesn't depend on the sampling density anymore. 
it has been normalized out. And what we get is, maybe by no surprise, the Laplace Beltrami operator on the manifold. This explains why this previous example showed such a nice embedding, because we were actually considering the embedding of a rectangle, as we have shown before. Now the question is, how does the convergence in infinitely many data points and bandwidth balance out? And there are results on this as well. I would just like to flash this error bound quickly and note that it is important that the bound goes to infinity if epsilon goes to zero before n goes to infinity, which tells us that the bandwidth cannot be, cannot be shrunk too fast against zero in comparison to the number of data sets, which is a very important property because for bandwidth going to zero, we would disconnect our data set basically. Going back to our faces data set, if we have the unordered data set on the left, we apply diffusion maps and use the first diffusion map coordinate to order the data set. It gives us a natural, very nice result, which we thought we would have. It orders the faces according to the viewing angle. And if we now take and map the diffusion map coordinate, the y-axis, uh, against a ordering of, uh, or against the previous ordering of our data points, then it comes by no surprise that we get actually something like a half cosine. Because the half cosine is the eigenfunction of the Laplacian on an interval, and our data set was basically a one-dimensional manifold in a high-dimensional space, so basically an interval in there. Let us now turn to the main part of this talk variables. And let me start with uh, describing the problem in molecular dynamics. What uh, you see in the movie here is uh, the simulation of, a, of the motion of a simple molecule and butane. Uh, what uh, we can see here right away is uh, that there are dynamical features on different time scales. There is a fast scale vibration of uh, the atoms constituting the molecule, but uh, also on a lot slower time scale than this, the general geometry of uh, the molecule is changing. These are the so-called conformations and uh, they are color coded in the movie. This uh, separation of time scale in the motion is uh, then uh, called metastability of uh, the conformations. The changes are happening on a lot of lower time scales. Now, these uh, conformations themselves and uh, the statistics of the transitions between the conformations um, have a very important effect on the biomolecular properties of uh, biomolecules, usually a lot larger than these and butane, and uh, hence they are at the center of our interest. We would like to find these conformations, and uh, we would like to also quantify the statistical information of transitions between them, which are then related to so called time scales in the problem. Now, the problem with this is uh, that these systems are usually very high dimensional. Even for this simple molecule, butane, if we, if we take an all atom description of 14 atoms, um, then in a three dimensional space, we already have a 42 dimensional uh, configuration space, which uh, then translates to at least a 42 dimensional system. If we don't even take momenta uh, into the dynamical description, if we do, we end up with 48 dimensions and you can see that uh, finding metastable conformations in, in more than 80 dimensional space becomes a highly non-trivial problem. Things can get much simpler if we know where to look at 
In this case, let us consider the backbone of the molecule, this turquoise uh, part, and the so-called torsion or dihedral angle, which is the twistedness of these outer limbs of the backbone uh, along the central axis. If we were to plot the time series of a typical, um, typical molecular trajectory, only uh, of this torsion angle of the molecule, we would get something like depicted here. We would be right away able to read off where the metastable states are because we see this indication of metastability. Uh, the system stays for a long time in one of these angular regions and then jumps suddenly, stays there for a long while again and uh, fluctuating uh, in between. So in this one coordinate, in this one angle, the metastable states decompose uh, right away into different sub-intervals of uh, the range of the angle zero to two pi. And uh, then we can also, by simple counting, find the transitional uh, statistics what we are interested in. Um, in this sense, because it, uh, this coordinate reveals all we want to know about the molecule, we call this uh, coordinate or variable a collective variable of the system. Now, the non-trivial task is to find these collective variables in general systems. It is not always clear, as in the case of butane, what to look at. And uh, this is what we are going to be concerned with next. The step afterwards would be to project or reduce the dynamics um, of the whole system to this uh, one reduced variable or multi-dimensional but lower dimensional collective variable but that would be a story for a different time so let us now start with asking how how are we able to find good collective variables and for this we will need a definition of, uh, of collective variables a little bit beyond the intuition that we had on the previous slide nevertheless let me still go on a bit intuitively. So if we go back, we see that somehow this collective variable brings order into our uh, metastable states. It is ordering it in some intuitive fashion. So a collective variable, we would say, describes progress between the different metastable states um, of the system. And this would be the starting point of, uh, of a definition of collective variables. Let me try to drag this home with this simple cartoon. Let us consider a two-dimensional system in this case, depicted here on the left by a potential landscape, which is shown by the contour lines. This potential has two minima here, one on the left, one on the right. There is a saddle in between. And the dynamics we are considering is a diffusing dynamics in this potential landscape. That means the dynamics tries to go deterministically downhill, but is subject to um, additional stochastic forcing. Um, and if we take the strength of the forcing right, then uh, most of the time the system uh, spans uh, close to the potential minima here and here and every now and then it switches between them um, making the system metastable. Since uh, most of the transitions will happen through this uh, saddle point here in the middle kind of along uh, this dashed line which one would call transition path um, we expect to have a one-dimensional collective variable for the system. The, the main players in our consideration are going to be these PTX, the so-called transition density functions. These describe for a fixed time scale T greater than zero, the probability density distribution of the stochastic system here on the left, uh, if it started at point X. 
So let us start the system from these gray points, one of the gray points here, x1. Then uh, after a well-chosen time scale t, uh, what we are going to observe is uh, usually that the system is more likely to be found in the left-hand side well, because the starting point is just closer to it than in the right-hand side. So if we go over here to the right, where we are in density space, so in the space of uh, intervable functions, the, the density profile of the, the transition density, Vtx1, is going to be something similar to this. There is more weight in the left well than in the right one. Meanwhile, if we start in any of the points, the wide points here, x2 on the right, then we will get a profile something like this because it's more like, likely that we end up in the right-hand side well. Now, what we observe is that really the vertical component of these points, the white or the gray respectively, doesn't really matter uh, considering the profile of the transition density. It is going to be quite similar to these. Or in other, other words, these uh, points, which are now densities here on the right-hand side, are going to be quite close to one another. However, if we were to change the horizontal coordinate of the starting point, we would be able to change the weighting of these two bumps uh, by quite a bit. So in this sense, uh, if we were now drawing all possible transition densities for all possible starting points uh, from the left here in the right, then we would get a point cloud which is quite strongly accumulated along a one-dimensional set. At the core of this uh, point cloud, the one-dimensional core, we will call uh, the transition manifold. And this uh, this accumulation around the one-dimensional set is now the blueprint uh, of the property that we have a one-dimensional reaction code, a one-dimensional collective variable, sometimes called also a reaction coordinate, uh, in the system. Now, we can make this also uh, rigorous in the following sense. For a reversible uh, diffusion, like the one uh, I mentioned on the previous slide. If now this set of transition densities for all possible uh, starting points uh, is epsilon close in the space of interpretable functions to some R-dimensional set, then we can prove that there is an R-dimensional collective variable reproducing the dominant time scales of the system up to O epsilon, which uh, is just paraphrasing the fact that it is a good reaction coordinate. And um, so far I know this is the first constructive method, this is the first constructive statement how to find provably good collective variables. So the part provably good refers to this quantitative statement. Whatever time scales are, uh, I haven't defined them, just to keep things simple. Uh, we can reproduce them by using these collective uh, variables. But why am I actually claiming that this is a constructive method? Now, if we go back here, if uh, we were to find a parametrization of uh, the one-dimensional core of this set here in density space, and we would pull it back uh, to the left-hand side, we would get a good collective variable, right? And this is why I was uh, introducing diffusion maps or manifold learning in general in the first part of this talk, because this is exactly the tool which we can use to do so. Note that each point here on the right belongs to exactly one starting point on the left, and this is how the pullback works if we have a coordinate value for Vtx2 for this point, then we can pull back and use the same coordinate value here. All right, so how does this work then in practice? Well, 
we need some some kind of a uh, manifestation, some some realization of uh, our transition density function for a given set of starting points x in our state space. So we compute lots of realizations, and these realizations then give us an empirical version of uh, the density uh, ptx. And first, we bring this uh, infinite dimensional object down to finite dimensions by basically exploiting uh, a uh, embedding theorem which relies on the Whitney embedding theorem. Uh, we can be still in finite, uh, in high, but we are in finite dimensions. And in these finite dimensions, then we are applying diffusion maps to find the geometry to find the so-called collective variable. So how does this work in an example in 10 dimensions? We have a multi-well potential in two dimensions, x1, x2, that this is shown here on the left. We have seven potential minima. These are the dark regions and uh, they are arranged in a circular fashion such that the system is uh, likely transitioning between neighboring wells. Um, the potential in all other eight coordinate dimensions is just harmonic. This way, a diffusion in this potential landscape is going to be metastable with seven metastable states, and uh, we expect to have a circular um, collective variable because transitions only happen between the neighboring wells only. Now, if we apply our machinery, we take a net of initial points x1 in uh, this 10-dimensional space, we compute realizations and we embed them. We embed the uh, empirical densities described by these realizations. Then we get the following picture, still in high dimensions, in this case, three. So this is now an embedding of the transition manifold. Each point here refers to one density attached to one starting point on the left. Now we see right away, it seems to be a very well one dimensional structure. If we apply a manifold learning method like diffusion maps and pull back the corresponding value of uh, the variable again to x1, x2, so the first two coordinates uh, here, we see that the collective variable which we computed really um, fits very well with uh, the angular coordinate in the system, which means it is really the collective variable we were after. And this is of course just a simple system. Colleagues of mine have uh, applied the machine, this machinery also to more realistic um, molecules. All right, let, let us now switch to a completely different application, fluid dynamics and uh, some objects there which are called coherent sets. Let us consider transport of, uh, of a dynamical system. And uh, in this setting, we call a set of uh, states, a set of initial conditions in state space coherent if they are resilient to filamentation by the dynamics. In other, other words, if we were to add a little dispersion to uh, this dynamics, a small random perturbation, these sets would be resilient with respect to this dispersion as well. Here's a simple example. If uh, I take a um, flow, two dimensional and two sets uh, in its state space, a black one and a gray one, and I map them somehow. I'm not showing the flow, I'm only showing what happens to the sets after evolution. Then I get this black set 
which has moved somewhere but stayed circular. Meanwhile, the gray set is stretched and folded uh, by the dynamics. I would call the black set coherent because it uh, persisted and uh, didn't get filamented by the dynamics while the gray one got filamented. And if uh, I would add a little bit of dispersion to the dynamics, this dispersion would kick out um, any point from <clears throat> the gray set pretty easily because it is a thin and elongated structure. Now, by this uh, defining property of being uh, resilient and uh, the dispersion, these coherent sets have an utmost importance in transport in complicated fluid dynamical ap applications as they just transport whatever is trapped in them very efficiently through space. Now we would like to find these coherent sets given a system and for this we would like we would need actually some kind of a uh, characterization and uh, the characterization um, we will use here uh, goes back to Barry Froiland. He defined a set as coherent if uh, the ratio of perimeter of the transport is set by the flow phi. So this delta is uh, denoting the perimeter of the set and uh, the absolute value. It's uh, basically co-dimension one um, surface measure. So if the size of the perimeter divided by the size of the volume of uh, or the volume of the set stays small for the whole time uh, in which we are considering the system, a finite time interval t0, t1. If this is the case, then we call set A coherent. Freund also showed that coherent sets, this definition of them, can be characterized by and found by eigenfunctions of the so-called dynamic Laplacian. This is a operator acting on functions over state space. And uh, by considering thresholded uh, regions of these eigenfunctions, he was able to characterize coherent sets. In a different work, Karash and uh, Keller showed that if one considers a Lagrangian heat flow, which uh, I'll get at right away, right below, then uh, this Lagrangian heat flow of the system uh, approximately for small perturbation sizes, uh, for small diffusion coefficients has the generator um, delta the dynamic Laplacian. But what is this Lagrangian heat flow? Well, the question one poses here is, how does a slightly perturbed dynamics, that is now a differential equation in the Ito sense with the deterministic part, the drift part, um, going back to the original dynamics, which gives rise to the flow, plus for some small epsilon, we are considering some Wiener noise added to it. So how does this slightly perturbed dynamics actually spread across now the trajectories of the original dynamics? So we are considering a diffusion in a deterministically co-evolving coordinate system. Um, now, can imagine if the, if we consider this system on the black set, then uh, since the black set is coherent, it will be hard for this diffusion to get away from the trajectories which are defined by this black set and are transported here because the system, the, the set itself stays coherent uh, with a very strong geometric integrity. Meanwhile, for the gray set, it would be quite easy for this slightly perturbed diffusive dynamics to spread across trajectories because of the filamentation. In this sense, now we are considering a metastability problem 
uh, on the trajectories of this potentially non-autonomous system. And since we are searching for so-called metastable trajectories, we are in the setting of uh, our previous applications and we could ask how do collective variables look like in this system. And adding another layer to this problem, we would like to find these coherent sets and the collective variables somehow describing order between these coherent sets um, in the setting where we have no model, just some data. For example, buoy data, uh, which we get from GPS tracking of uh, buoys in the ocean. So let us assume we have a finite number of times at which there are a finite number of tracers which are affected by the flows sampled at these times. So we have a finite amount of deterministic dynamic data from which we are asking ourselves where the coherent sets are and how do they evolve in this system. Since uh, on the previous slide, we have seen that we are actually looking at a diffusion which is spreading across trajectories of the system. It suggests itself to that, that diffusion maps could be the right tool to approximate uh, this since we have the deterministic dynamical data given to us. And indeed, this is the case as we will see right away. So let us consider the diffusion map matrix PT epsilon for bandwidth epsilon uh, for the data at time t. That means we are looking at, for a fixed t, uh, all the positions of our tracers xit. We are computing the diffusion map matrix P epsilon t, and we are averaging all these matrices over all times t. Then we are building the generator, as we have done before, dividing the, uh, subtracting the identity and dividing by the bandwidth. And we were able to show for the hands arising matrix L epsilon, that if we apply this matrix pointwise to a sufficiently smooth function f to the data points, then in the infinite data limit, so number of tracers m going to infinity, and then taking the bandwidth uh, towards zero, what we get is nothing else than the dynamic Laplacian applied to this function, almost surely, and the dynamic Laplacian was the object from the previous page, um, which describes and characterizes by its spectral properties, coherent sets. So how does this look like in action? Let us consider a Bickley jet, which is a perturbed Bickley jet, which is uh, a model of an atmospheric jet on a band uh, around a fixed latitude. So it's, uh, it gives rise to a horizontal periodic motion. And uh, here are our tracers given, but without the colors. And the colors are going to be imposed later. We are only given the positions and their time evolutions. Now, we apply our methodology, it's so basically embed by this previous diffusion map um, procedure. Uh, every point, every trajectory from the right here to the left, this picture is what shows us the so-called collective variables. So every point here on the left is a trajectory here on the right. And now we impose the colors on the left by clustering the left-hand side picture. So coloring close by points uh, by the same color. We use here nine different colors in actually a uh, eight or nine dimensional space uh, of which I'm actually only showing three dimensions. And if we take these colors and pull them over to the trajectories on the right, what we see that we really find coherent sets because the different colors do not mix with one another. We can see even more. We can see the manifestation of collective variables um, in this case. Namely, if we were, for instance, to 
uh, try to transport some material from the green set here on the top to the orange at the bottom, then we see we would have to drag uh, any particle through this dark blue region, through this brown jet in the middle, through this uh, light blue region at the bottom to arrive in the orange set in the end. Now if we go on the left hand side and look how can we uh, reach from the gray region, the orange one, along this skeletal structure, we see that we have to cross the very same regions, the dark blue, the brown, and the light blue. So in this sense we could call the picture on the left stress transport skeleton, or the coordinates there are coordinates of transport and mixing. In this sense, they are collective variables because they describe how a slightly uh, diffusive mixing uh, transport would occur between the coherent sets. So we are, we are obtaining order between the coherent sets through uh, these coordinates. We were applying the very same methodology also through actually real buoy data. You can see here, so here you see at the bottom the buoy positions, we compute the collective variables. I'm showing two, a two-dimensional uh, collective variable here. So this is the embedding of all the buoys, what you see on the top, which right away gives us some, uh, some order in uh, the whole picture. Um, of course, clustering, what we did here, will then show the first order instance of um, coherent sets in the oceans. Basically, they are quite well aligned with the different ocean basins. Uh, but we, again, see more. These variables give us the information that, for example, there is no direct mixing between the yellow and uh, the red regions. Mixing between them occurs through the blue one, uh, which tells us if we look at the map at the bottom that uh, the Indian Ocean and the North Pacific only mix, uh, at least given this buoy data, uh, through the South Pacific and there is no mixing through the Indonesian archipelago. So again, we gain some more direct, if you wish, geometric uh, understanding of the dynamics. Now, the third and final application is uh, going to be an explorative work. Here, the system which we are given is given as uh, an experiment which uh, colleagues Weiss and Ahlers conducted. We have a cylindrical container, uh, a couple of meters of size, filled with water, such that the bottom is uh, bottom is heated and the top is cooled such that water motion arises. This is then called Rayleigh Bernard convection. Sometimes what you see is uh, quite little structure turbulence, but sometimes some large scale circulation patterns evolve, like uh, we see here uh, depicted by the arrows warm water rises on the one side and it will drop or sink on the other side, giving rise to one large scale roll. So this is called the single roll state. Sometimes the single roll breaks up and two counter-rotating rolls on top of one another occur. This is called the so-called double roll scale. And sometimes there is um, no such large scale structure present and the dynamic switches between these. Now, all we see about this system is actually a 24 dimensional uh, measurement. They implanted thermistors, temperature uh, measuring devices into the wall of uh, the cylindrical container. Eight pieces, equi-angularly placed, 
seen from the top at three different levels. 8 times 3, 24, and these 24 uh, different temperature measurements they obtained every couple of seconds, um, hence obtained a very long time series. Now, we took this time series as our dynamical data and we computed collective variables of the system. A two-dimensional embedding of collective variables would look like this on the right, where the position is the collective variable of each measurement, each measurement is a dot here, um, while the coloring is actually from the original work of Weiss and Alers. On the top, the color encodes the orientation of a single row, what they uh, computed, somehow knowing the geometry of the problem and knowing what to look for. Um, if there is a single row, you can imagine in the cylindrical container it has some kind of an orientation. And this orientation um, can be described by an angle between 0 to pi. This is the color code here. You see it fits very well with the angular coordinate of our collective variable. And on the bottom, uh, the color code is uh, what they have identified as a single row state depicted by blue and a double row state depicted by uh, red. Of course, if there is no one single row uh, identifiable, then uh, they didn't assign any, uh, any one angular coordinate to it. That's why here the middle part uh, is missing. We are only showing those points for which they were able to identify a a orientation of the single row. So we see right away that the collective variables we compute without knowing anything about the system gives us very well the structure of uh, um, the basically the attractor of the system, what uh, our physicist colleagues were most interested in. So the angular and basically the radio coordinates uh, of our collective variables show us the most important large-scale features of the dynamical evolution in this, well, supposedly infinite dimensional uh, system driven by a noisy Navier-Stokes um, equation. We were able actually to go one step further and learn also something about the dynamics. Uh, by looking at the time series projected on these collective variables, uh, by looking at the statistics of motion in the angular and in the radial coordinate in our embedding, we obtain very good, uh, very good estimates of the diffusion coefficients of the angular velocity of the single row state and also of uh, the time scales of switching between single and double row states in this convective experiments. Now, I was keeping the theory uh, very simple. Here at this point, I would just like to note um, or give you a very short uh, note on this. The theory we use for this collective variable uh, definition and characterization with respect to co coordinate projected transfer operators. Um, as looked at by Legault and Believre 10 years ago. This is in a way similar than Galerkin projected transfer or Koopman, Koopman operators, but uh, the coordinate projected version is still an infinite dimensional object. In this sense, it differs a bit from uh, finite dimensional projections like um, one uses in Koopman mode decomposition or uh, the work of very Janakis, Janakis and uh, Harlem. The differences are articulated in this paper uh, by Stefan Weiss and myself. Uh, I would only note uh, quickly on uh, the comparison of our method of collective variables and something which is quite well known in fluid dynamics, dynamic mode decomposition. If we were to apply dynamic mode decomposition, DMD, to this problem, then we would get 
slightly inferior uh, results with respect to the time scales regarding the angular motion of uh, single real estates. This is because uh, DMD being a projection of uh, the transfer of Hopman operator of this infinite dimensional system to linear coordinates uh, in our measurement coordinates. It is capable, linear coordinates are capable of describing the angular motion. However, linear coordinates are not seeing anything about switching between single and double row states because that would, those would require uh, nonlinear uh, non coordinates or nonlinear functions in the measurement coordinates. One could go one step further and apply something called extended uh, mode decomposition. And then the question would be, what are good dictionaries? What is a good set of basis functions on which one can project the dynamical information? And uh, while EDMD requires so the knowledge or, or the finding of a good dictionary, uh, what I would like to put forward here is that our coordinate, um, that our collective variables finding method kind of automatizes this procedure. It automatically finds nonlinear coordinates, uh, which are uh, at the heart of the dynamical evolution of the system and uh, building functions of these coordinates are then uh, by their very nature, by their very construction, good, uh, good dictionaries uh, on which an EDMD kind of analysis can be built on. Right, if we are not looking at only two, but more uh, dimensional embeddings, like more collective variables, then we find higher order dynamical information in this system. For instance, we find the attractor uh, as a disk as before, but other uh, higher, higher order coordinates can show us excursions away and back to the attractor in this rayleigh bernard convection uh, as depicted here on the right. So this is basically the end. I would like to stress again that uh, it seems like that collective variables exist in a wide variety of uh, complex dynamics. They stem from at least their characterization stem from statistical physics and uh, in our case molecular dynamics. They can be quite well uh, take, uh, carried over to uh, fluid dynamical problems and coherent sets, and a different fluid dynamical application with the rayleigh bernard convection, uh, which is a purely exploratory work in this case, seems to show also strong results in terms of what collective variables are able to describe in this system. Questions for the future are uh, whether the theory uh, can be carried over to non-reversible systems, like for example, uh, this one on the right, the rayleigh bernard convection is a non-reversible dynamics, what happens in infinite dimensions, and also whether there are other high dimensional and complex systems in which uh, the view through the lens of collective variables can be beneficial. With this, I thank you very much for your kind attention.